In this video, we're going to look at the Minkowski metric tensor and the space-time invariant. The space-time invariant, which is also called the space-time interval, is a way to measure a kind of distance between two events in space-time in special relativity. So far in special relativity, we've found that different observers disagree on time, space, and velocity, and therefore also momentum and kinetic energy. The only quantity that all inertial frames seem to agree on is the speed of light in a vacuum, c. In this video, we're going to introduce a new quantity that all inertial frames agree on, which is the spacetime invariant s squared for a vector, which equals ct squared minus x squared. The spacetime invariant is how we measure distances in spacetime. This video is going to be all about taking geometry that you're familiar with in everyday life, which is Euclidean geometry, and changing it slightly so that we get Minkowski geometry, which is the geometry of space-time and special relativity. Instead of measuring distances or length using the familiar equation x squared plus y squared, we're going to measure distances in space-time using the space-time invariant, ct squared minus x squared. Instead of using the Euclidean metric, where the dot products of an orthonormal basis are 1, 0, 1, we're going to use the Minkowski metric, where the dot products of an orthonormal basis are 1, 0, negative 1. Instead of using circular trig functions like sine and cosine, we're going to use hyperbolic trig functions like hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. And instead of doing circular rotations in 2D space, we're going to do hyperbolic rotations in space-time. We'll see that Lorentz transformations that we've been studying all along are really just hyperbolic rotations. First, let's talk about the concept of length in Euclidean geometry. We'll see that the space-time invariant is the equivalent concept in Minkowski geometry for special relativity. We know that the familiar formula for the length of an object in 2D space is just the Pythagoras' theorem formula, length squared equals x squared plus y squared. We can use this formula to get the length of an object, and this formula is nice because it works in any orthonormal basis. So as long as our basis vectors have length 1 and are perpendicular to each other, this formula will work and give us the length of an object. Here's an example. Let's say that this pencil is a vector denoted by capital R. In the ex ey basis, this vector equals 4 ex vectors plus 3 ey vectors. If we take the formula for squared length and plug in 4 for x and 3 for y, then we get 4 squared plus 3 squared, which is just 16 plus 9, or 25. If we use another orthonormal basis, given by ex tilde and ey tilde, then r equals 5 ex tilde vectors exactly. If we plug in 5 and 0 into the squared length formula, we get 5 squared plus 0 squared, which is also 25. So we get the same answer for the squared length of the pencil in any orthonormal basis. Now, in space-time, in special relativity, we have a similar concept called the space-time invariant, s squared, which equals ct squared minus x squared. Notice that we are using a minus sign here instead of a plus sign. This minus sign is extremely important. The space-time invariant helps us measure a kind of distance between two events in space-time. And the result is the same in any orthonormal basis in space-time. Now, in space-time, the definition of orthonormal is a bit different than you'd expect, and I'll talk about this more later. But for now, you can think of space-time basis vectors as being orthonormal when they scissor together like this, as we've seen with Lorentz transformations. And this definition of orthonormal is called Minkowski orthonormal. If this vector, capital S, connects two events in space-time, then S equals 5 ET time vectors and 3 EX position vectors. Plugging 5 and 3 into the space-time invariant formula, we get 5 squared minus 3 squared, which is 25 minus 9, or 16. If we use this other space-time basis, et tilde and ex tilde, s equals 4 et tilde vectors exactly. Plugging in 4 and 0 into the space-time invariant formula, we get 4 squared minus 0 squared, which is also 16. 
So the space-time invariant, S squared, is the same in all orthonormal space-time coordinate systems if we use the Minkowski definition of orthonormal. In special relativity, space-time basis vectors that are Minkowski orthonormal correspond to inertial reference frames. This means that for a given space-time vector, the space-time invariant S squared is the same in all inertial reference frames. So we can go ahead and prove that the space-time invariant is the same in all inertial reference frames. Let's start with the space-time invariant in the CT tilde X tilde reference frame. So S squared is equal to CT tilde squared minus X tilde squared. Recall that our Lorentz transformation to move to another inertial frame with velocity beta looks like this, where beta is just a fraction of the speed of light, V over C, and the gamma coefficient is just 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. If we plug in this formula for CT tilde and X tilde into the formula for the space-time invariant, we get this. Now if we expand ct minus beta x squared, we get four terms. ct squared, beta times x squared, and we get minus ct times beta times x twice. So we write that as minus 2 ct beta x. And if we expand minus beta ct plus x squared, then we get another four terms, beta ct squared, x squared, and once again we get minus beta ct x twice so we write that as minus 2 beta ctx. So we have one set of brackets with a positive gamma squared in front, and another set of brackets with a negative gamma squared in front. But notice that 2 ct beta x is the same thing as 2 beta ctx. This first one is negative, and the second one is negative, but also has this other negative sign out in front of the brackets, so it's actually positive so the negative and positive terms cancel out with each other. And if we pull the gamma squared out of everything and put it in front, then we get this. Now, notice that inside these brackets we have ct squared and also negative beta ct squared. So we can factor out ct squared from both of those and get ct squared times 1 minus beta squared. And we can also factor out x squared from beta x squared and negative x squared and this gives us negative x squared times 1 minus beta squared. And this negative sign out in front is what lets us change signs in here, so that 1 is positive and beta squared is negative. So notice that we have 1 minus beta squared in both of these terms. So we can factor that out and put it in front, next to the gamma squared. But remember, gamma is just 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. And if we square gamma, we just get the reciprocal of 1 minus beta squared. So these cancel out and just become 1. And that means that we're left with ct squared minus x squared, which is the exact same formula we started with, except now it's using the new time and space coordinates. So what we've shown is that the space-time invariant s squared is the same in any two coordinate systems that are connected by a Lorentz transformation. In other words, the space-time invariant is the same in all inertial coordinate systems. So we've confirmed that the space-time invariant S squared is agreed on by all inertial reference frames. So physical length is a quantity that we agree on in 2D physical space, and the space-time invariant is a quantity that we agree on in space-time. However, when talking about 2D length, we generally only talk about positive lengths. But the space-time invariant can actually be positive, zero, or negative. In the case of S squared being positive, this must mean that the size of the time coordinate, ct squared, is greater than the size of the position coordinate, x squared. If we remember the equations of beams of light, x equals ct to the right, and minus x equals ct to the left, then a vector with a positive s squared value has a beta value magnitude x over ct that is less than 1. Remember, beta is just the fraction of the speed of light, v over c, and the speed v is just position x over time t, so beta is just x over ct. 
This means that it is slower than the speed of light. So this means that a vector with a positive S squared value has a slope that is more vertical than a beam of light. Therefore, this vector exists in this shaded region of the space-time diagram, which is called the light cone. Also, if we measure this vector in a reference frame where the tip and tail of the vector are at the same position, the position coordinate is zero. In this case, s squared equals ct squared. Assuming positive time, this gives us s equals ct. In this special case where the position is zero, we also denote the time coordinate by c times tau. C times tau describes the time between events in a reference frame where the events happen at the same position. This is called the proper time between the two events. The proper time tau is the shortest possible time between two events when measured from an inertial reference frame. Any inertial reference frames that are moving with respect to the events will measure a time that is increased due to time dilation, which we discussed in Relativity 104, Part C. C times tau describes the time in distance units like meters, and tau on its own describes the time in ordinary time units like seconds. Remember, when measuring time in meters, we just measure how long it takes for a light beam to travel that distance. Here's an example. If we calculate s squared for this spacetime vector s that connects these two events, then we get positive 16, which is greater than zero. This means that s, which is equal to c times the proper time tau, equals 4. We can think of c times tau equals 4 as measuring the proper time in distance units. If we wanted to measure the proper time in ordinary time units, we would divide both sides by c to get tau equals 4 over c. Since c times tau is 4 time units, this means that the shortest possible time between the events at either end of the spacetime vector s, according to an inertial reference frame, is also 4 time units. This is the time measured in the reference frame that views the events to happen at the same position. And it is the shortest possible time because moving reference frames will see the time dilated to be longer. For example, the original reference frame we used measured a longer time of 5 time units. Now in the second case where s squared equals 0, this tells us that x squared equals ct squared. In other words, ct equals plus or minus x. These are exactly the two equations of beams of light, with positive x being a light beam going to the right and negative x being a light beam going to the left. So s squared equals zero describes a vector that's pointing along the world line of a light beam. And that's all there is to say about the s squared equals zero case. Finally, if s squared is negative, this means that ct squared must be less than x squared. This means that the beta value has a magnitude x over ct that is greater than one, meaning it is faster than the speed of light. This means that a vector that has a negative s squared value has a slope that is more horizontal than a beam of light. Therefore, this vector exists outside the light cone in a space-time diagram. Also, if we measure this vector in a reference frame where the tip and the tail are at the same time, then the time coordinate will be zero. In this case, the square root of negative s squared is equal to x assuming positive distance. We also denote this by the special symbol L0, which is the length of an object in its own reference frame. L0 is called the object's proper length. The proper length is the length of an object when measured in its own reference frame, and it is the longest possible length that an object has. This is because moving reference frames will see the object length contracted, and will measure it to have a shorter length. If we calculate the s squared value for this spacetime vector s, we get negative 16, which is less than zero. So if we take the negative of this and take the square root, we get the proper length of this vector, which is four. This means that in the vector's own reference frame, we know that its length is exactly four distance units long. 
So in the familiar Euclidean geometry of 2D space, the length L of an object is agreed upon in all orthonormal frames to be x squared plus y squared. But in the Minkowski geometry of spacetime, it is the spacetime invariant s squared, which equals ct squared minus x squared, that is the same in all Minkowski orthonormal frames. And the spacetime invariant can be positive, zero, or negative. Also, vectors with positive s squared are called timelike vectors, because their s value represents proper time between two events. Vectors with s squared equals zero are called light-like vectors because they point along the paths of light. They are also called null vectors because their s value is zero. Vectors with negative s squared are called space-like vectors because their s values represent proper distance between two events. Now I've been saying that inertial reference frames are given by Minkowski orthonormal basis vectors. But what does Minkowski orthonormal actually mean? To find out, let's compare the Euclidean metric in Euclidean geometry and the Minkowski metric in Minkowski geometry. Let's say that in 2D space we have a vector capital R given by x e x plus y e y. To get the squared length of this vector, we just take the dot product of R with itself. If we expand the vector out in the basis, and then distribute over the dot product, we get four terms. These four terms can be rewritten in a matrix equation like this. And this matrix of dot products is called the metric tensor matrix. I already covered this in Relativity 103 Part D. If we assume we're working in an orthonormal basis, then the basis vectors have length 1 and are perpendicular to each other. This means that a basis vector dotted with itself equals 1, and a basis vector dotted with any other basis vector equals 0. This means that in an orthonormal basis, the metric tensor matrix is the identity matrix, and the formula for the squared length of a vector is x squared plus y squared. But remember, this is only true in an orthonormal basis. So in 2D space, the metric tensor is called the Euclidean metric tensor, and in an orthonormal basis, the metric tensor matrix is the identity matrix. But now we're going to talk about what it means for a basis to be orthonormal in space-time. A Minkowski orthonormal basis is one where the time basis vector dotted with itself gives positive 1, but a position vector dotted with itself gives negative 1 and any mixed basis vector dot products go to zero. So in space-time, let's say that we have a space-time vector capital S, which is ct e t plus x e x. To get this vector's Minkowski length, we do the dot product of S with itself. After expanding S in terms of the basis and distributing over the dot product, and then writing in matrix form, we get this. And this matrix is the Minkowski metric tensor matrix, which helps us measure distances in space-time. Remember, in a Minkowski orthonormal basis, ET dot ET is positive 1, EX dot EX is negative 1, and ET dot EX is 0. So in a Minkowski orthonormal basis, the metric tensor matrix has components 1, 0, 0, negative 1. And the formula for the Minkowski length of a vector is ct squared minus x squared, which is just the spacetime invariant. So the spacetime invariant is just the squared length of a vector when measuring it in a Minkowski orthonormal basis. In other words, it's the length of a vector when measured with the Minkowski metric tensor matrix. If we were to change basis using the Lorentz transformation equations, we could calculate the basis vector dot products in the new basis. To calculate et tilde dot et tilde, we just sub in these formulas from the Lorentz transformation, and then distribute over the dot product. et dot et goes to plus 1, ex dot ex goes to minus 1, and the mixed dot products go to 0. This leaves us with gamma squared minus gamma squared times beta squared. Factoring out gamma squared, we get gamma squared times 1 minus beta squared. 
but knowing the definition of gamma, if we square it, then we just get the reciprocal 1 over 1 minus beta squared. So this goes to 1. We can use a similar approach to calculate that et tilde dot ex tilde is 0, and ex tilde dot ex tilde is negative 1. So we find that a Minkowski orthonormal basis that is transformed by a Lorentz transformation stays Minkowski orthonormal. And that means when we calculate the squared length of a spacetime vector, which is the spacetime invariant, we end up using the same Minkowski metric tensor matrix. So in an orthonormal basis, the Euclidean metric tensor matrix is the identity matrix, 1, 0, 0, 1. But the Minkowski metric tensor matrix for spacetime is 1, 0, 0, negative 1. Now, it is possible to write these metric tensor matrices in a non-orthonormal basis as well. In Relativity 103D, I gave examples of non-orthonormal bases in 2D space, whose metric tensor matrices were not the identity matrix. Because of this, the formula for Pythagoras' theorem is different in each case. Similarly, we can have non-Minkowski orthonormal bases in space-time, whose metric tensor matrices are not the matrix 1, 0, 0, negative 1. And the corresponding formulas for the space-time invariant are different in each case. However, for the most part in special relativity, we're mainly going to focus on Minkowski orthonormal bases, where the Minkowski metric tensor matrix is 1, 0, 0, negative 1 because these correspond to inertial reference frames. So in conclusion, for any orthonormal basis in 2D space, the metric tensor matrix is the identity matrix. And we can calculate the squared length of a vector using this matrix equation here. And in spacetime, for any Minkowski orthonormal basis, the Minkowski metric tensor matrix has the components 1, 0, 0, negative 1 and we can calculate the squared length of a vector, which is the spacetime invariant, using this matrix formula. One thing I will say is that in previous videos, I said vector components are contravariant, and that we should always write contravariant things as columns. However, here I'm writing contravariant vector components as a row, which breaks this rule. Unfortunately, if we want to get the right formula for the spacetime invariant using the standard rules of matrix multiplication, we also have to break this rule and write the contravariant vector components as a row. It's technically possible to write the metric tensor as a nested row of rows, and this lets us write the vector components as columns as expected. But this is a little bit awkward. So unfortunately, for getting the correct spacetime invariant formula, we need to break the rules and write the contravariant vector components as a row here. Next, we'll talk briefly about trigonometry. This topic isn't as important, so I'm going to rush through it pretty quickly, but it's useful to know a couple things about it. You're probably familiar with the trigonometric functions sine and cosine, which are used in Euclidean geometry. These are the circular trig functions. We're also going to learn about the hyperbolic trig functions used in Minkowski geometry, which are the hyperbolic sine, also called sine h or sinh, and the hyperbolic cosine, which is also called cos h or cosh. Now, the equation of a circle is x squared plus y squared equals r squared, where r is the radius of the circle. And you can see examples of circles with different radii here. Now, we can use circular angles denoted by the Greek letter theta to help us find coordinates along a circle. Various points along a circle of radius r can be obtained by calculating the x-coordinate to be r times cos theta and the y-coordinate to be r times sine theta. In this case, we define the angle theta by saying that theta over 2 is defined to be the area of this circular wedge with a radius of 1. This matches up with the familiar area of a circle formula, pi r squared, when we use a full circle angle of 2 pi radians. The x squared plus y squared equals radius squared formula also gives us the fundamental trig identity, 
cosine theta squared plus sine theta squared equals one if we sub in the coordinates for a radius of one. We can do something similar for the equation of the space-time invariant. Now the equation ct squared minus x squared equals s squared is not the equation of a circle. Instead, it's the equation of a curve called a hyperbola, where s squared is the hyperbola's invariant. We can have hyperbolic curves with positive s squared, zero s squared, or negative s squared. Here's an example of a hyperbola with positive s squared. It has two disconnected portions, a top portion for positive ct and a bottom portion for negative ct. Because this hyperbola has s squared equals positive one, this means that every vector whose tip is on the hyperbola curve has a space-time invariant of plus one. Hyperbolas with larger s squared values are farther from the origin, and hyperbolas with smaller s squared are closer to the origin. Note that these curves never cross these diagonal lines with slopes of positive one and negative one. These lines that never get crossed are called asymptotes. For the case of s squared equals zero, we end up with the equations x equals ct and negative x equals ct. These are the two equations of diagonal lines with slope one and negative one that were previously the asymptotes. For the case of negative s squared, we again have two disconnected portions, a left portion for negative x and a right portion for positive x. We can use hyperbolic angles denoted by the Greek letter phi to help us find the coordinates of points on a hyperbola. Coordinate ct equals s times cosh phi, and coordinate x equals s times sinh phi, where the area of this hyperbolic wedge is defined as phi over two. Note that unlike circular angles, which loop back on themselves after a rotation of two pi radians, hyperbolic angles continue increasing towards positive infinity because hyperbolas also increase out toward infinity. With the formula ct squared minus x squared equals s squared, for an s value of one, this gives us the fundamental trig identity cosh phi squared minus sinh phi squared equals one. So just as circular trig functions can help us get the coordinates of points on circles using the radius, the hyperbolic trig functions can help us get the coordinates of points on hyperbolas using that hyperbola's s value. Now, by putting sine and cosine inside of a matrix like this, we get a transformation that does a circular rotation on basis vectors. A circular rotation of a box just causes the corners of the box to move along a circle. This means that a circular rotation keeps the radius of a circle constant. We can also invert this matrix just by changing the sine of the angle theta. And if we put cinch and cosh inside of a matrix like this, this gives us a transformation that does a hyperbolic rotation on basis vectors. A hyperbolic rotation of a box just causes the corners of the box to move along hyperbolas. This means that a hyperbolic rotation keeps the invariant of a hyperbola constant just as a circular rotation keeps the radius of a circle constant. We can also invert this matrix just by changing the sine of the angle phi. Note that both circular and hyperbolic rotation matrices have a determinant of one. This means that when we do either a circular rotation or a hyperbolic rotation of a box, the area of the box stays the same. A hyperbolic rotation is just squishing the box in one direction and expanding it in the other direction in order to keep the area of the box constant. This is what causes basis vectors to scissor together in a hyperbolic rotation. Now before, I said that hyperbolic rotations are just a different name for Lorentz transformations. It turns out that these two matrices are actually just different versions of the same thing. 
You can pause the video if you want to go through the proof, but basically, if we define cosh phi to be the gamma coefficient from the Lorentz transformation, we can prove that the beta coefficient from the Lorentz transformation equals sinh phi over cosh phi, which also happens to be the definition of hyperbolic tangent of phi. This means that gamma times beta is just sinh phi. Knowing this, it's not hard to see that a Lorentz matrix is really just a hyperbolic rotation written in a slightly different way. So Lorentz transformations really are just hyperbolic rotations. A Lorentz transformation will compress spacetime coordinates in one diagonal direction and expand the spacetime coordinates in the other diagonal direction, keeping the area of all boxes in spacetime constant. This is exactly what a hyperbolic rotation does. Also, it's a lot easier to prove that multiplying two Lorentz matrices together gives another Lorentz matrix if we multiply the hyperbolic matrix form instead. When we combine two Lorentz transformations together, all we're doing is adding together the hyperbolic angles from each individual Lorentz transformation. So in Galilean relativity, in order to combine velocities, we just added the velocities together. But in special relativity, instead of adding the velocities of each reference frame together, we add the hyperbolic angles of each reference frame together. So to sum up this video, in the Euclidean geometry of 2D space, a circle with a constant radius r has the formula r squared equals x squared plus y squared. And in spacetime, a hyperbola with a constant spacetime invariant s squared has the formula s squared equals ct squared minus x squared. In the Euclidean metric with an orthonormal basis, the metric tensor matrix is just the identity matrix. But in a Minkowski orthonormal basis, where we have ex dot ex equals negative 1, the Minkowski metric tensor matrix has this negative sign in the position entry. We also learned that the circular trig functions sine and cosine have hyperbolic versions, which are cinch and cosh. We also learned how to make a circular rotation matrix using sine and cosine, which preserves the radius of a circle. And a hyperbolic rotation matrix can be made with cosh and cinch, which preserves the invariant s squared of a hyperbola. And a hyperbolic rotation is just the same thing as a Lorentz transformation. One last thing I want to bring up. In this video, I was working with space-time using one dimension of time and one dimension of space. Obviously, there are three dimensions of space, x, y, z. So space-time is really four-dimensional. One dimension of time and three dimensions of space. So the full space-time invariant formula would look like this. And the full Minkowski metric tensor matrix looks like this. Basically, in this video, I was using the special case where a vector's y and z components were both zero. However, some textbooks will define the spacetime invariant with opposite sign, where the time coordinate is negative and the space coordinates are positive. The Minkowski metric tensor matrix also has opposite signs. The convention with negative space that I use in this video is called the mostly minuses convention, and the convention with negative time is called the mostly pluses convention. Both of these are popular conventions for the Minkowski metric. The physics of special relativity works perfectly fine with either one. It's just that some formulas and quantities will have a negative sign in one convention but not the other. In future videos, I'll be using the mostly minuses convention that I used in this video, where the dot product of position vectors are negative. So if a formula I show has an extra negative sign in it compared to your textbook, it's probably because your textbook is using the mostly pluses convention instead.